talk is called Damn GraphQL, uh, Attacking and Defending APIs. I'm extremely excited to be here. Um, my name is Dolev. Um, my, this is my first time speaking and participating at NorthSec. Um, extremely excited for the opportunity and I'm uh, excited to also share what I've learned about GraphQL in the last uh, six months or so. So um, to get things started, um, I want to kind of talk about the very basics uh, on GraphQL. Whether you know what GraphQL is about or you have no idea what this is, this is the right talk for you. I'm going to bring everybody to a point where we all can uh, understand what GraphQL is about, um, what makes it very unique, and also the attack surface of GraphQL. Uh, towards the end, we're going to show a very practical demo of a, of a real-world CVE. And uh, lastly, I will share all the resources that I, poss I could possibly gather in order for you to actually learn and practice GraphQL by yourself. So let's start with what is GraphQL. Uh, so what, GraphQL is a technology by Facebook that was released a few years ago. It's a query language for APIs. You can think of it almost as, a, as an alternative to REST API, except it works a little bit differently. Um, it uses three main kind of operations called queries, mutations, and subscriptions. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, we're going to be focusing on queries and mutations. But just so you have some context on what subscriptions are, it's basically a long, uh, uh, basically a, a, a read operation that's long lasting, typically used for chat purposes. So you have like a, a pub sub mechanism uh, to drive uh, applications such as chats that require real time messaging. Um, the reason why GraphQL was kind of born is to resolve a few pain points that REST API has. And there are two kind of pain points uh, that REST has today. One of them is called overfetching. And what overfetching basically means is that when you call an API, you will typically get more data than you actually need. Um, and underfetching is basically the opposite. Sometimes you may call or uh, make an API request, and you don't get enough data back, which basically forces you to follow up with another, another additional request in order to complete the original intent. So what GraphQL is basically doing is it solves that, and it also the result of, of, uh, of it is that it reduces the round trip the client needs to do in order to complete a, a transaction. So when we talk about GraphQL, we need to start with a kind of the data model, the schema. A schema is basically a kind of a definition of objects and fields. And for the purpose of this talk and throughout this talk, I'm going to be using the data model of Pastebin a lot. Uh, and it will make sense towards the end why I actually took that as an example. So if you don't know what Pastebin is, it's basically a website where you can upload text snippets and so on. Um, and you can share, the, share, the, share them with people or you know, uh, anonymous people can also read them uh, depending on their permissions. So you can see on the right side, we have an object type called paste. And, the, and paste has a bunch of metadata or fields associated with it. So if I upload a code snippet, I'll be the author or the owner of it. And a code may, and a snippet may have a title or content. And maybe there's a permission flag, whether it's public or private. And you get kind of the idea. You can define a, a type with its uh, associated fields. And this is what basically constructs a, a GraphQL schema. Um, once you have a schema, you can then uh, start querying that data. So when we want to read data from a GraphQL endpoint, we would use something called queries. Um, it, and it's primarily for reading operations. So you can see on the right side, we have an example request, uh, a JSON request that basically takes the content and title or ask for the content and title of all the pastes on the website. And you can see that the response is very similar to how the request is constructed. We're getting an array of pastes. But we are, we're only getting the title and content, which is exactly what we asked for. Um, we're, you'll notice that we haven't uh, we haven't received from the server whether the uh, like the owner name or whether it's a public page or a private page. We really got only what we asked for, and this is what GraphQL is kind of all about. So if you wanted to change data as opposed to just reading data, things like deleting something or creating something, you would use an operation called mutation. Um, and, and mutation is basically to alter information on a web application. So you can see on the right side, we have an example how we're actually creating a new uh, paste on the website. Um, this create paste uh, operation is, has two uh, parameters, and we're passing the title and content, and the response reflects that exact paste that we just now created. So just a few GraphQL things that you will likely find quite interesting from a security standpoint. Requests are usually carried over post. What I mean by that is whether you delete something or, or change something or even just read without changing anything, the requests will typically be carried over post. Um, and another interesting thing about GraphQL is that it will typically live under a single route. 
Um, so you would typically see slash GraphQL is a very common one, but it obviously can live in other uh, spots as well, depending on the implementation. But um, there is a, a few predictable locations where GraphQL typically lives. And if you are in a pen test and you want to try and enumerate or find where GraphQL lives, if GraphQL is even uh, configured, you can use uh, an Nmap NSC script I put together. It's at the bottom of the slide, which basically attempts to uh, figure out where GraphQL lives. Um, and lastly, one of the interesting things here is that GraphQL will typically return a 200 response. And what I mean by that is, let's say that you're asking to get some information about an account that exists on a web application. If the account doesn't exist in a REST API world, you would typically expect like a 404 or something like that. In GraphQL, it's a little bit different. In GraphQL, you would get a 200, but the indication that the account doesn't exist would be reflected in the response. So you might have like a key called errors and the value would be the account doesn't exist, but the status code is still gonna be 200. And the reason I listed all these things, and I think they're interesting from a security standpoint, is if you do blue teaming, blue, blue teaming instant response, log analysis, and you have an application that's backed by GraphQL, you will immediately notice that the investigation is gonna be a little bit more difficult. You will not have like self-describing routes just uh, such as you would have in REST API. And if you're used to looking for specific status codes to determine if something went wrong or if somebody had uh, you know, access forbidden or unauthorized uh, request or something like that, you will not have this in GraphQL because you would typically use it if C200s. Um, so quite interesting from blue teaming standpoint, a little bit challenging. It changes the game a little bit. Um, so this is kind of the core things that make GraphQL altogether a little bit different than the REST API. So now that we know a little bit about GraphQL just enough, I wanna jump into GraphQL attack surface. So from a pen testing standpoint, when you run into an application that is backed by GraphQL, um, one of the first thing you wanna do is you wanna figure out how to communicate with it. So if you're lucky, you're gonna run into an, uh, an implementation that uh, happens to have introspection enabled by default. What introspection is is a mechanism for GraphQL to kind of self-describe what it knows and the, the data model. Um, and it's a feature that typically could be enabled or disabled, obviously, depending on the implementations. Some implementations actually have that enabled by default. Um, and it's not a vulnerability per se. It's, it's really a feature um, that its uh, you know, intention is to uh, make it easy for people to integrate with your API, but obviously it has a security trade-off. So you really have to uh, understand your own environment and whether you actually need to have that enabled um, and, and act accordingly. So if you are a pen tester and you run, run into an introspection uh, um, mechanism that is actually enabled, what you would get in return is you're gonna get this response that describes the data model. And what you, wanna, you would wanna do next is you could obviously parse it like manually um, and, and read through it. It's a little bit uh, uh, overwhelming, I would say, depending on how big the application is, but you could use something like a GraphQL visualizer so that they can make, you will take the kind of the JSON response, fit it into the visualizer, and it will kind of draw a nice diagram of the relationship between the different fields and objects. So it, it makes it fairly easy to read. So from a blue team standpoint, if you are protecting a graphical application, try to do a self-check whether you have introspection enabled, disable that if you absolutely don't need that, um, but you could also place it behind some kind of access control. Um, so just so you know, GraphQL by default doesn't come with authentication mechanisms. It's something that you have to kind of slap on top of it in addition, so you have to take care of that. And this is one of the problems with GraphQL. There's a lot of things that you need to do in addition after you actually implement that. So really disable it if it doesn't make sense in your own environment. So if you're a pen tester and you, you, know, you run into a GraphQL uh, application that has introspection disabled, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna figure out how to communicate with it? One thing that GraphQL has is a, basically a feature called field suggestions. And what field suggestions are is basically a way for GraphQL to tell you about fields in case you're making some kind of a mistake. So in the example at the bottom, you see I'm requesting for the type and content of the pastes but for some reason I had a typo and the paste, paste uh, doesn't have the, the letter E. So the response that you're gonna get from GraphQL is that, did you mean paste or paste? So it will try to do this matching or try to find the closest word to what you, you supplied. 
So, and you can see how you kind of leverage that. You can build a very comprehensive uh, uh, word list of, of common Eng uh, English words and just try and send it to GraphQL until you figure out enough fields to basically construct a proper query. Um, what's interesting about this feature is that it's available in all the possible popular GraphQL implementations today without any ability to disable. Um, again, this is not a feature. This is not a vulnerability. It's a feature, but it has a security trade-off because you might not want to, you know, tell too much about how your your data is structured. So, from a blue teaming standpoint, this is a little bit tricky because you, there is no like option to toggle that off. You would have to go into the code and com either comment it out or replace it with something else that makes sense in your context. Just so you know, there's a user experience impact here because it helps people to integrate with your. Uh, GraphQL. So if somebody's integrating with your, your uh, application and they made a typo, it's very convenient for them to know where they made that mistake so they can move on with their life. So just acknowledge and, and know that there is a user experience impact. If you don't care about that, you could go ahead and patch it. Um, let's talk about denial of service. And denial of service is going to be a very common thing in GraphQL. In GraphQL, there is the ability to have batching uh, uh, support. And what I mean by batching is GraphQL can take a bunch of queries, even the same query multiple times, and the client can send all of those in an array, and the server will process them one after another. Batching would typically not be available by default. You would have to either install a package or you know, code it yourself. Um, but, but just so you know that if it's available, there's a few things you have to, to look out for. Um, so this is a very uh, interesting uh, method to uh, bring down a service, and I will show you exactly what I mean by that later on. But one thing that you have to kind of remember, I mentioned that GraphQL lives under a single route, uh, slash GraphQL. So if somebody is sending a lot of those expensive requests toward a server from a network uh, control or application control, such as like web application firewalls, it's going to get a little bit tricky to come up with uh, solid rate limiting rules against that. Just, just keep in mind. So from a blue teaming standpoint, if we have batching in, uh, in our application, there's a few things you could do to try and protect it. The very first thing you could do is to write some kind of a middleware analyzer and check the array length that you're receiving. This is a very basic check, but if you get an array with 100 elements, maybe you want to drop that. Um, alternatively, you could do something a little bit more sophisticated called cost-based analysis. And what cost-based analysis is, think of it as like assigning a value to a field or an operation, and let's say a value of 10. And in this example, you see we have an array where we're calling the, the operation backup system twice. And since we assigned a value of 10, that adds up to be 20. And since the max cost that we have on the back end is 10, we're going to drop that request because it's just too expensive to complete. Um, but overall, batching is, is a feature you can disable. So really only use it where it makes sense and just be aware of the, the trouble that it can bring uh, along with it. So if you're a pen tester and batching is disabled, there's a, there's a way you can try to break down a service uh, in an alternative way. Uh, there's a, a concept called query aliasing. And what query aliasing is, is you basically supply some alias name and you can then call the same query multiple times by supplying different alias names. Um, so this is a, uh, it, it's not similar to batching in that sense, but it can definitely act the same from a denial of service side of things. You can call a very expensive query 100 times in a single query, and the, the server will have to process those. Um, so uh, just keep in mind that, again, just like the batching queries, it can evade or make it difficult to uh, mitigate from a networking standpoint, because it's all going to be under the same uh, GraphQL route. Um, from a blue team standpoint, um, again, to mitigate against that, you would have to build some kind of a, uh, analyzer or use what I mentioned before, cost-based analysis. Um, you could write some kind of a middleware that will try to do a count on the number of aliases that you receive and drop it if, you, if, it, if it's a number that doesn't make sense. But again, there's a, a significant lift that you have to do yourself in order to protect your, your, your own graphical implementation. And this is almost like a, I, I would say that GraphQL is a little bit vulnerable by default. And you will see what I mean by that throughout this talk. Um, another avenue for uh, denial of service is circular queries. And what circular queries are is basically if you, if you have a schema where you have two types referencing one to another, for example, in the, in the paste bin example, you have paste and the paste has an owner, but the other, the vice versa is also like, uh, applies. So an owner may have a paste 
So if you have a data model where two uh, objects can reference one to another, somebody can then create a query where they just reference these objects to another, one to another. Um, and then they can really build a very complex and deeply nested query um, and uh, bring down the server or at least cause a, a significant resource consumption. And if you take that and you chain it with what we learned earlier about batching queries or aliases, then you can really amplify this attack uh, by just you know, abusing features, really. So from a bootcamping standpoint, the, the fix is relatively e uh, trivial in this case. Uh, so some implementations, for example, in Ruby, they would allow you to set a maximum depth limit. And so for example, you could set a max depth of 10, and if you receive a query that's nested 99 levels deep, um, you're gonna drop that query uh, altogether. Um, so again, it, the, the, that value that you set for yourself is what makes sense in your own environment. You need to have some knowledge on the types of queries that you uh, have in your own environment in order to not you know, cause trouble or down, downtime or drop requests that are benign. Um, operation name in GraphQL is, is interesting. Operation name is this optional uh, text field that you can supply along with a query or a mutation, which basically describes what the query and mutation uh, is doing. This is, a, I would say, a free text field. Um, you could supply anything. Um, and it doesn't have to match anything. So for example, you can see on the right side, we're calling get users, but we're supplying get paste as an operation name. Um, the, re the, the, the way you can kind of leverage that from a pen testing standpoint is if the site operator is using the operation names as a way to figure out like which operations are more common and they're doing some analytics on it. Maybe they're logging it somewhere. Um, maybe they're naive enough to do some kind of decision-making based on that. Um, just keep in mind that this is a, a value that you control as a pen tester. Um, and some implementations actually allow you to supply special characters as well. Um, so this can become an injection opportunity as well as spoofing. So if you're supplying an operation that's very benign, uh, uh, but you're actually calling a query that's, I don't know, maybe something that could cause problems, you're effectively masking what you're doing if, if you know, the logging on the back end is, is naive. So on the blue team side of things, to defend against this, it's pretty trivial. You need to have a list of acceptable operation names. And if you receive an operation name that's not on that list, treat it uh, as you know, any other untrusted input. Drop that and, and log it in a safe way so that you at least know that you had some kind of a tampering attempt uh, in, in the, specifically in the operation name. Um, so fairly trivial way to uh, mitigate against this. This is... Uh, Field duplication is probably one of my favorite and less known GraphQL things. Some of the implementations today, um, what they do is they don't really care if you supply the same field multiple times. What I mean by that is you can see on the left side, we're creating a query where we get the name of the owner of all the pastes on my website, but we only specified once. And that would be what a proper, valid, trusted air quotes uh, would look like. And let's say that you're doing some kind of a timing analysis to see what the response looks like and how fast it is. Let's say that the server took 100 milliseconds to respond. If you take name, the, the field name, and duplicate that 100 times or 10 times, whatever, and you see that the server takes longer to respond, you will know that they don't really do any kind of deduplication or any kind of intelligent um, query analysis. And you will soon see in this talk how you can leverage that to really cause uh, a significant resource consumption. So if you want to protect against this, um, one thing you could do is you can write, again, a, a kind of an analyzer that we do dedupe the fields. It's a little bit error prone, so you know, keep in mind. Um, or you could use cost-based analysis uh, like I talked before. Another thing you could try to leverage is something called persistent queries. And persistent queries is, a is an interesting mechanism because it basically allows the client to supply a hash that represents the actual query. So the, the, the GraphQL server on the back end will have a list of trusted hashes. And if the client is supplying a hash that's not recognized, you're gonna drop that request. So you can at least have some assurance that the query structure itself wasn't tampered with. But one thing you should know is that you can still pass variables alongside that hash, which would get inter interpreted by the server. So there are still injection opportunities, even when you use this kind of mechanism. Um, so in summary, um, just so you know, GraphQL is not that different from REST API when it comes to the vulnerabilities uh, themselves. So OWASP top 10 still very much applies to GraphQL. 
Um, there are security tools out there, both both from like a, a testing, from a, like a red teaming uh, standpoint, but also from blue teaming standpoint. But there's not a whole lot. There's a few. Um, so a few things you should know. Uh, OWASP Zap has an add-on uh, that you could uh, uh, you could um, install, which basically will try and test your GraphQL and fuzz it and so on and so forth. Um, there's also a, a Burp um, extension for this that will basically help you construct proper queries. Um, and you can then use Burp Suite to test GraphQL um, uh, setups in a very more convenient way. Um, but in overall, GraphQL is fairly young. Um, and what I noticed from looking at the various implementations uh, across the different languages is that I noticed that there is a misalignment between the security features that are offered by the various languages. So for example, PHP may have uh, persistent queries uh, available, but Python may not. So there is no consensus around like which features should be available to everybody. Um, and there's some gaps between the maturity of different, different languages. So if you do choose to implement that, make sure that you have all uh, the, the, the proper mitigations in place to protect yourself against everything that I just mentioned, um, which basically come by default when you use GraphQL. So with that, I want to jump into the attack demo. And what I'm going to show today is a CV that I disclosed uh, just a few weeks ago um, related to a GraphQL plugin in WordPress. So in WordPress, you have this plugin marketplace, and one of the plugins is a uh, called WP GraphQL, which basically all it does, it gives you a out-of-the-box ready GraphQL interface for your own blog. So pretty popular, 100,000 downloads, 10,000 uh, active installations, um, and it's very easy. You download it, and it's ready without doing anything uh, special. One thing you should know about this plugin is that once you install it, or at least that was true until a few weeks ago, the batching was enabled by default, and there's no way to turn that off. Uh, so you install it, and there is no way you can mitigate against some of the attacks that I just demonstrated. Um, if you receive, the plugin is not intelligent enough to uh, drop or reject certain requests that look bizarre or are malformed or constructed in a, what seems to be malicious uh, kind of construction. Um, and it's partially authenticated. What I mean by that is, you know, graph, uh, WordPress should allow anonymous users to view blog posts and comments and stuff. So the GraphQL API follows that. Um, all of these were resolved in 138, I believe, uh, version 138. Um, but I do want to show how it looked like a few weeks ago. So let's talk about the exploit. So what we're going to do is we're going to get um, all the comments from, so we're going to read this diagram kind of bottom up. We're going to get the comments and posts from GraphQL backed uh, WordPress. And then we're going to duplicate the field comments 10,000 times. And then what we're going to do is we're going to utilize the fact that batching is enabled by default, and we're going to take this, these complex queries, put them together in an array, and send them to the WordPress instance. And we're going to do that using 300 threads. So you can see how complex this query is going to be for the server to actually complete. Um, so with that, I do want to show a demo, and I hope that this works. Um, and if it doesn't work, I have a recording, but let's uh, cross our fingers. So when we um, when you install the plugin, you're going to get um, this this shortcut to basically interact uh, like this interface that you can interact with GraphQL. So this is like the admin view of WordPress. So we can start writing a query here, um, which will basically grab the content of uh, the the post on the website. So when, when you run this query, you're going to get the basically the, the comments on the page, just like you would expect. So what we're going to do is I'm going to utilize all these weaknesses in order to try and bring down WordPress altogether. So I'm going to um, kind of tail the logs on the server and see what's happening when we're actually executing this query. So fingers crossed, um, the server will uh, try to process those because there are no mitigations in place against this. Um, and th there's no way for the site operator to actually uh, handle this unless they're putting this behind some kind of a web application firewall. So you can already see that we're running out of memory. So my SQL process actually died and it's not able to recover at this point. Um, and if you uh, look at the WordPress instance, you can see that it's down. Um, and this took 
less than 10 seconds. And you can think about the op opportunity if you have a lot of nodes sending this kind of traffic towards a server, um, if you haven't protected your GraphQL implementations. So just so you have some context from how easy it is to bring down a server uh, backed by GraphQL without the right mitigations in place. Um, so with that, I want to jump into a um, how you can actually go and learn GraphQL yourself. I want to equip, with, equip you with enough tools and resources so that you can learn yourself. So when I started with GraphQL just a few months ago, uh, the first thing that I looked up was I want, I want to practice GraphQL by hacking it. Um, and there was no one solid and, and mature platform to do that. Um, there are a few labs here and there, but I wanted something else. So what I did was I came up with them vulnerable graph, GraphQL application. And you're from, if you're familiar with DVWA, um, it's very similar, except it's focused on GraphQL. Um, so everything that I talked about is, is actually in that web application right now. Um, I put a lot of emphasis on the education part. So there's a lot of resources and things like that for you to, to leverage. And whether you're a beginner to GraphQL, like I was six months ago, um, or you've dealt with GraphQL just a little bit, there's, uh, there's something for everybody. So there's two modes you can kind of switch between to harden and unharden the server, depending on the, the I guess, the, your knowledge with GraphQL. And the link to the GitHub repo is at the bottom of this slide. So when you install it, you're going to get this uh, dashboard. There's a lot of resources and tools and, and blog posts and things that I kind of threw in there so that you can actually learn as you go uh, about GraphQL and, and how it looks like when you install GraphQL uh, without any protections in place. Uh, and with that, I want to thank everybody for listening and I hope you enjoyed this talk and learned just a little bit about GraphQL and, and how we can, as a security community, make it better. Thank you.